Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show, discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Welcome, one and all. It is time for the Books That Make You Show, and I'm your host, Desiree Duffy. And today we're talking about books that make you go on an intergalactic adventure with snoodles in space. Books that help us learn while they strike our imagination, and there it is, are some of the best books out there. Returning for a record six times on the Books That Make You Show is everyone's favorite crankiness expert, Stephen Joseph. Now, he's also an award-winning children's book author. He's written adult books as well. Now, his latest book is called Snoodles in Space, Episode 2, The Snoodles, The Zoodles. Zoodles. The Zoodles Strike Back Against the Snoodles. Or We'll we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, It's a tongue twister, for sure. And my tongue often gets twisted in a very delightful way when I'm reading Stephen's books. Now, this is the third installment in the beloved Snoodles series, and it captivates readers of all ages. It's got humor, there there are the other books, adventure, and it also has valuable life lessons. Now, in addition to being an author, Stephen is a first generation American, son of a Holocaust survivor, He's a masterful attorney, seasoned negotiator, engaging speaker, and a marathon runner. And he is just an amazing human being. And there he goes. He's already, he's like, I'm off. I'm running. Okay, Stephen, give us, in your own words, hi, give us the the lowdown. What's going on in the Snoodles series, if you could? I, I I have no idea what's going on. It's just so many things going on. It's it's very exciting. Uh it it the, the thing that's going on is it's a series. That that's the exciting for me. You know, you write a book and uh not like when I wrote the first book, I didn't go, I have a series here. I was just saying I write a book, and boy, that's a good book. I was very happy about that. And and my illustrator loved it so much. He goes, you have to write another book. And I go, I don't have another book. And then I went to sleep and I woke up and what happened? I had another book. And so he, then he, we were all excited. He did another book and he goes, you have to write another book. I go, I don't have another book. I went back to sleep. I woke up and I got another book. So now it's, it's the third book and it's, it's a series. So I'm very excited about it. I love that you have very poignant and powerful life lessons in your books. And that's something that works for adults as well as for children, all ages, right? I think you say from five to 99. Can you talk about some of the educational and the behavioral insights that you have in the book? Well, uh, this this book in particular uh, is, uh, I, it's somewhat derivative of my adult book, Cranky Superpowers, Life Lessons Learned from the, the Comic Crankosaurus Chronicles. In that book, there's actually a chapter uh, called Willy Nilly Dilly Dally Crankosaurus when we do things willy nilly or dilly dally. And uh, so then I had the idea of making, and there was actually I had the characters' names, but I, I thought I had the idea of converting Brianna Brainy Brutal and Ricky Rockadoodle, who are heroes in the second book, into Willy Nilly Noodle and Dilly Dally Doodle, uh, because they had Willy Nilly Dilly Dust in, in their strudel noodle doodle cake. You know, so so and it happens, it happens, but yeah, so that was like an, an idea that that struck me. And in in this book, um the and a lot of my ideas happen when I, I, I go running. And then when I have an idea like that, it, it's then the dust gather or it's like, like, like whatever the dust goes onto your shirt or whatever the electricity. But so the, the, uh, the lightning bolt was uh, thinking about Willy Wonka and, uh, or Charlie and the chocolate factory. And in that story, uh, the, you have Charlie and everybody loves Charlie and he's such a good boy he behaves and he listens to directions and and he comes 
from humble beginnings. And then you have these spoiled kids who like, I want more, more for me. And I'm not going to listen. I'm just going to take what I want because I deserve everything. So I was thinking about that. And, and like I've watched the original Willy Wonka movie 500 times. And uh, there was like a media circus, a media frenzy. And this is like in the 1960s. It was like, like, like the paparazzis and all that. And uh, I was thinking like these kids, they probably got reported in the news what happened to them. And, and that movie, like, a, like, like a, a girl, she turns blue and I like, forgot what happened to the boy. But, but there's a few kids who uh, yeah. uh, get in that. So I thought like, let me make some characters who kind of don't do what they're supposed to, but then they end up being the heroes because of course they get shamed and kids make fun of them because of the media frenzy. And you make a mistake, and that mistake is a label on you for for life. You know, so you know. I know when I was in in first grade, uh, like one kid called me the boogeyman because he said like, "Oh, I picked my nose and ate the boogers," and uh, and Stephen, then confession time. Yes. Did you? No, I didn't. <gasps> I didn't do what I, I flicked him. I flicked him and yeah. probably got on in his hair, you know, it's just a night. <laughs> and, and I wanted maybe to get the booger out of his hair because I was just being nice. You know, you don't want to put your boogers in other people's hair. That's not very, very polite. Right. So, so anyway, uh, you know, I, and, and then I, like when I was a kid, I was in a bowling league and I had my own bowling ball. Uh, because I was a good bowler. So so my initials, Stephen, my middle name is Neil. So it was, it was SNJ. And kids call, call, started calling me Snidge. And, uh, <laughs> like Snitch, you know? Yeah. And, and I hated that. I hated yeah. that. You know, kids could be really, really mean. So, so of course, now with, the, like, the, the newspapers putting headlines about about the two characters, uh, Frimpy Frumpy Froodle and Wimpy Whiny Woodle, uh, in the newspapers, and kids made fun of them. So it, yeah. I felt that, I, like I, that was I, an important message. Yeah, I really like that. So let's unpack that a little further, this idea of reversing expectations about these misbehaved kids. Because to your point, when your kids... We're all bad. We're, we're, we all flick our boogers, and we all call each other names. And... It seems to me that in society right now, we have this thing against bullying, and it definitely should be there. But a lot of times the kids who are doing the bullying, they get these labels as you talk about. But yes. to your point, and maybe you can help unpack that a little bit more, bad kids aren't necessarily always bad to the core. No, no. And uh and like even like in my my cranky books, I even uh, I talk about that where, uh, like I, like that's why I gave it the name Crankosaurus because like kids like like people always say use your words use your words and if you say I'm angry I'm angry I'm angry I might think you might think I'm an angry person I'm good using my words and I happen to be an angry guy, uh, but I I rather have it I have a Crankosaurus I'm feeling well this and but I'm a sweet kid anyway. And it's the same thing here. You know, the, these kids made bad decisions. They shouldn't have that bad label. Just like I don't want to have kids have an angry label, angry person. You know, that that's it. So, so that that I thought that was important, and uh, and I love when I could do it in the most ridiculous way, and and still make it believable that you really when you just fall into the story. Uh, when you can make ridiculous completely believable, then it feels magical. So I'm, I'm very proud of this book. And y yes, you and your artist, Andy Case, do such a spectacular job. Um, and the way you describe that common crankosaurus that kids have too, because you're right, a lot of times parents, educators say, say your words, use your words. And they're just, they're still learning how to use their words. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about if you encourage kids to rise up to a challenge, how they will? 
Well, that, that's what happens in this book because uh, uh, Frimpy Frumpy and Wimpy Whiny over here a plot to put uh, willy nilly dilly dust into the water supply of Noodle Ham and turn everybody into willy nillies and dilly dallies. And they have a choice. Uh, they could just, you know, let this happen. And they talk about, should we just, should we like warn them or should we just stay quiet? Uh, because these kids have been mean to us. Maybe we should just stay quiet. Oh, sure. Um, you know, and then they decide, no, 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 no. We have to, we, we can't live in a world where people drive in grudels and uh, that smell and, and filled up with gruel and, and dirty is the waters and all that stuff. So they make a good decision and, and they save, actually to save the entire planet uh, from uh, a world of, of gruel polluting waters and everybody being willy nillies and dilly dallies. So, so it's, it's a, it's a, I like the story. I like the way, uh, you know, these kids rise up. Yeah. And th that's another poignant message, the environmental component and the stewardship for our world and cleaning up the rivers as, as is done in this book. Why, why is that something that is a, a message that you want to get out there? Cause you've done this with your other books too. You have a strong uh, environmental and stewardship message that resonates throughout this book series. Well, I, I want to, I mean, it, it, there's two pieces to that. There, there's obviously environment. I want to care like a, leaving the planet in the better place that we got it. Uh, but, but also convincing people we could do this. So, uh, so that, that's, that's important. So in the first book, uh, we, I introduced a snoodle, which runs on noodles and the, you know, everything is, you know, it replaced a stinky crap mobile and, uh, it changed the world. It really changed the world for the better and uh, and now now we're we're, we're having uh, uh, you know a, a challenge with the with the rivers and the and the oceans and that's filled with gruel dirty gruel and we come up with a, a solution to clean that too so it, it really again it, it's ridiculous but you believe it and what if like ridiculous is true. So I was just reading the other day, uh, the Jetsons. I grew up watching the Jetsons cartoons and like, uh, like Zoom, they were doing Zoom on the Jetsons back in the 1960s or, or like a lot of things that, that, that they, gizmos uh, uh, on the Jetsons cartoon actually are reality. Uh, so as much as this is like, oh, that's uh, vacuum doodles, uh, vacuuming up the gruel from the oceans. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, but hey, let's make it crazy. Cars that run on noodles, that's ridiculous. Well, maybe maybe 50 years from now, we'll have snoodles. Who knows? Well, Don't, and we can't count it out. Exactly. And that creativity and thinking and instilling that in young minds, because oftentimes inspiration and innovation comes from two disparate points of view, things that you don't think go together, suddenly you try to put them together and then it gives you a solution that is unexpected. So I applaud you, Stephen, for doing that in these books. Thank That's you. really brilliant. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Can we talk also about the cultural and the educational messages such as you, you instill a love for museums and cultural exploration. Talk about yeah, that. Yeah, that, uh, that, that, uh, that comes from growing up in, in New York City. And uh, it, it's so funny. I think back when I was a kid, and like, first of all, back when I was a kid, you know, like eight, nine years old, I remember going on subways by ourselves and traveling by ourselves. And uh, museums was always like, like, wow, like we get to go into a big museum. And I, I even remember like being at that age and going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art 
and it was voluntary. You know, they suggested whatever. Uh, but we would have like six kids and we would give a nickel to cover six kids. So less than a penny per person to get into that museum. And they would let us in. We get the badges. And even then, we're like, I'm not like like a nine-year-old. We're like, we're from the Bronx. We're not thinking, oh, we want to see the latest Rembrandt and see like the <laughs> works of art and see naked statues, Greek statues, missing uh, whatever. Arms. <laughs> arms or whatever arms. parts. Yeah, <laughs> arms are good. Um, but like we weren't, we're just thinking the fact that we were in the museum, it was like going into like some holy place. So we, we loved museums and just seeing like, wow, there was this world before us. And even though we couldn't like think in, in maybe a sophisticated way, looking at different works of art that I still can't now, but, but that became something special and we would go back and back and back again. And every summer we go like three, four times a year. Then there's the museum of natural history and we would find other museums. So I, I always found museums to be uh, places that stretches a child's imagination. And uh, even going to go to Washington DC and, and the Smithsonian's or I remember that as a kid, like, wow. Like, yes, yeah, so that sort of thing. Stretching the kids' imaginations. So, yeah. I, so I like, like the fact that when, uh, when something, uh, something wonderful happens, then uh, we get a museum. So, like in the first mu book, we had an art museum. The second museum, uh, a second book, we had a museum of space exploration, and uh, and then in the third. Uh, book we have uh, like a, an aquarium and a water park so uh so every 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 book gets its own kind of like cultural place to go to which is fun and speaking of culture you do have a lot of representation and you celebrate a lot of cultures there's even an interplanetary marriage in this book yes yes uh it's 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 very sweet, um, like uh, and uh, uh, yeah, Droodle the Poodle and Doodle Kudoodle do get married, and it's 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 quite lovely. Uh, I appreciate the fact that underneath it all, you have this underlying message about love. Love is ultimately part of your themes. Yeah, no, and in, in all the books, and and I had to really go outside, like the like the box where. Uh, like the second book, uh, real, I had to make like you would never know it in the first book. Like Herbie Snoodleman and Sour Crudelman were brothers. They look nothing alike. They, they, they have no resemblance to each other. Uh, Herbie Snoodleman put Sour Crudelman out of business with the invention of the Snoodle. And the second book, like I make them brothers. And of course, like if your brother puts you out of business, you might kind of be cranky or you might want some revenge or whatever and even he rises up and becomes a hero and helps save the planet uh together with his brother herbie uh so uh and then there's there's the, the another brother norman noodle so like and, and he gets abducted by the zoodles with his wife so again there's the family get coming together to uh work together and put aside whatever. In this book, uh, uh, you you have uh, two. Actually, uh, it's the father who has who uh, gets approached by evil Kadoodle for this evil plot. But the kids, even despite that, uh, it's love for the people, love for for their friends or or their you know like their planet uh, that you know just really is is important and. Uh, even their father, Grumpy Grimy, turns out okay. He gets to sell grudels on Zoodles. So everybody has a happy ending. That's not a bad gig. You know, I was thinking if I chose a different career path, I'd be selling the scroodles on schmoodles and doing that too. Um, yeah. You have a very subtle air of British humor. And I think this 
allows the messages to be revealed uh, quite naturally in your storytelling. Can you talk about that British humor that you weave in oh so well? That, uh, well, I, I think it's true. Uh, but uh, like uh, my illustrator, Andy Case, who happens to be British, uh, one thing he keeps telling me what he loves about it is the British, you have the British humor. And uh, I, I kind of agree with that to the extent that uh, it's it's not in your face. It's not like it, it's like uh, uh, it, it's kind of like it's there's kind of underlying silliness that or you have to go look at it and uh, uh, it just doesn't bash you over the face with like so obvious, even though it is obvious, uh, but it it's. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Like Monty Python, if you go into my, Monty Python, it's a perfect example where it's just completely ridiculous. Uh, but again, you, you fall into believing this craziness, and, and that's what makes it special. So uh, uh, the, the characters are very in, in that kind of genre of like, well, that, that's kind of bizarre. Uh, and... You, you, but you buy into it and you love it because of the bizarre and kind of like uh, yeah, wonky, but silly, but funny, but ridiculous and all that stuff going together. It does have that Monty Python-esque air to it. Um, and I love that. And I do. I've been holding up as we've been chatting some of the illustrations. Those of you who are only listening, this is a reason for you to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can see sometimes the books as well as listen to us talk about them. But the illustrations by Andy Case are absolutely magnificent. Kudos to him for them and for you guys working together like this because you work together in a way that is actually oddly enough a little bit uncommon when it comes to the publishing world. And I think y'all have some future projects that you're working on together too. Do you want to talk about those? Yeah. So, so first of all, working together, uh, you know, like I do the story blocks, you know, right. Putting together a book, I write a story, then I have the story blocks. And then I say what, what's in my head, what I, my, like my illustrative vision that I can't do, but he can, I describe it. And uh, he takes it like three yards further, uh, which is, is wonderful. Or, or he might do something and then that triggers another idea. So there's that back and forth. Uh, and then what's so amazing is that uh, Andy not only is a great illustrator and, and those people on the radio, like Desiree is showing like great, great pictures right now. So, but anyway, getting to Andy uh, in last November, he rele releases an album. Check out my album. It's now on uh, Spotify, uh, Leap of Faith. And, uh, I, and then I'm going on, on a trip and I'm, I'm running and I'm listening to the music. And literally the music uh, creates the story. And it's not like it's partly the words, partly the, the guitar rhythm. So so um, so there's a song, uh, Lost Souls in the Dark. And uh, there's this guitar, but it sounds like 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 uh, like uh, spaceships going into through space to to. Uh, land on a planet it literally I, I have that picture in my head uh that it's these these spaceships are like flying through space just because of the way the guitar is going and uh then there's another song break free and again is this guitar so like just the title gets into the story but the, the guitar is like starts like d d d d d d it's like the spaceship landing on a planet. So uh, the next book that he is in the process of doing, and he's making a good progress, he tells me, is uh, Snoodles in Space, Escape from Zoodle Trash, and that'll be coming out next year, and we could be talking about this next year. But that that has, uh, 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 with uh, 
Strudel, the Poodle, and uh, Schmoodle, I believe it's Schmoodle, they get, get, they get captured and taken to Zoodle Traz. And the reason for that is because uh, you have uh, uh, this big, like uh, I talked about the music scene in um, Noodle Ham. And uh, one of the biggest acts is Swifty Swoodle and the Duwapa Doodles. And they do have this world tour uh, doing gazillion dollars. It had nothing to do with Taylor Swift, of course. <laughs> nothing, nothing. Nothing. nothing you're, to do. You're, you're not ripping her off at all. No. Um, so anyway, Cloodle the Grand Rudel on the planet Zoodle hears about this. And he wants to go uh, to uh, Earth and do his own world tour. But he really, he sucks. Yeah. yeah. And and on Planet Zoodle, the only music you could listen to is Cloodle and the Grand Rudels. Uh, so yeah. so he's when he gets annoyed, he kind of acts in this revenge sort of way. Ooh. And that's that, and that's how that's how uh, these these two poodles end up on on uh, Zoodle Tras. And the the gang has to get together and figure out a way to uh, to uh, to rescue them. Of course they do. Yeah. As as all good stories, everybody yes. needs a good rescue story. I love it. Escape from Zoodle Traz, right? Yes, wow. Zoodle Traz. Inspired Tra by Andy Case, and you guys are by his music. Yes, yes. And if it wasn't if it wasn't for that music, I would not have come up with that story. It's really cool how you're using his music and you guys just bounce off of each other. I know you've been to visit him a couple of times in the UK too. So you're collaborating together. I think yes. that's really an amazing, uh, um, amazing story in and of itself. We've had Andy on the show together too. So I invite people to go back and check out the show where we had both Andy case. Steven he, he's, he's a blast. It's a, it's, it's like, like he's like a brother and, and it's just like, it's, it's, Tremendous joy just to, to be with them. Yeah, yeah so. check out that show with Andy Case and Stephen Joseph on the Books That Make You Show. And Stephen, let us know where people can go to find you and find your books online. Give us your details, please. Oh, I, I have this website. It's a good website. It has a blog, and uh, it's an award-winning blog. So, oh, this is like an award-winning <laughs> and it's entertaining. But it's it's www.stephenjosephauthor.com, and uh, it, it's a place to that you will be thoroughly entertained, and you can find my books, which is good too. Excellent, Stephen Joseph, the author of Snoodles in Space, Episode Two: The Zoodle Strike Back which is the third book, actually, in the Snoodles series, award-winning author, author of many books, marathon runner, and an all-around fun guy who holds the record on the books that make you show for being on six times, folks, six times. Thank you so much for being with us today. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. And thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. You can find out more about us on our website. It's booksthatmakeyou.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, of course, on TikTok. Don't forget to sign up for our Webby award-winning newsletter. And that way you never miss out on any of the great guests that we have, like Stephen Joseph. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The host and executive producer of The Books That Make You Show is Desiree Duffy. Sound mastering and engineering by Dave Napox. Social media and content promotion by Siddhi Jahagirdar. Copywriting and editing by Mike Robinson. The Books That Make You Show is an award-winning podcast produced by Black Chateau Enterprises.